My wife said, when I told her what I'd be wearing, she was horrified. <laughs> no, I mean, she was really horrified. I looked in her eyes. It was in bed when I told her, and she was scared. She said, they're not going to think it's funny. And I said, I'm not trying to be funny. I'm serious. So what I'm trying to do here is exercise my right to the First Amendment. If you don't know what the First Amendment says, this is what it says. It says, Congress, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. For those of you who don't speak English or write English without LOLs or smiley faces, let me explain what that means. <laughs> that means that the United, since I am an American, the United States government cannot tell me what faith I have to believe in. It means that they cannot dictate one kind of faith that I have to follow. They can't say everybody has to be a Muslim. Everybody has to be a Christian. Everybody has to be Jewish. And it also means that I have the right to exercise, to practice my faith as long as it doesn't violate basic foundational laws or human rights, such as if my religion involved killing somebody on Tuesday and drinking their blood. That would be out. Or sacrificing cats on Thursday and making fajitas out of them. That would be out as well. But outside of that, based on the First Amendment, we have the right to believe what we want to believe. And so because of that, I thought it would be a great idea to create a new religion. And so I did what anybody would do if you wanted to start a new religion. I googled it, how to start a new religion. And what I discovered was that there's actually a whole article that gives you six steps to starting your own religion. Step one, this is what it says, think why you want to start a new religion. It's a good starting place. And it said, usually ask yourself, are you wanting to start a new religion because the current religions out there don't satisfy you spiritually? Or is it because you, you feel the other religions are too intolerant? Or maybe you have some really good ideas that you want to share. And so I thought about all these different ideas. and I thought, no, really, I think just starting a new religion would be awesome. So that's the answer. Step two says, understand that religions answer four foundational questions. Question one. Where did I come from? Question two, who am I? Question three, why am I here? Question four, where do I go after I die? I thought about these questions, and I thought about my religion. It doesn't really answer any of these questions, but it does let you know why there is a giant bronze chaparral outside this building. So you need to know that. Step three says, write down your ideas. And the reason it says to write down your ideas is because it, doesn't want, it wants you to make sure that you are serious about what you're thinking and you're not just talking nonsense. That was actually the words in the article, that you're not talking nonsense. But here's what I say. One's man nonsense is another man's genius. <laughs> Step four. Step four in starting a new religion is talk to people and here I am and you are the people. Step five. Let your religion grow, and oh, it will grow. And step six, be humble. I want you to know, as the founder of this new religion, that I will never put my face on a billboard, I'll never put it on money, I'll never put it on a t-shirt that advertises this religion, but I have started a new faith. It's called Dirt Tells. It comes from the Latin word... Well, let me make sure I know what that Latin word is. comes from the Latin word geococcus californianus. I know that sounds really bad. But that is the word for the greater roadrunner, more commonly known as the chaparral. And what you see before you is not an attempt at humor. This is the priestly garments, the priestly vestments. And since I am the only member of this faith, I am the high priest at this moment. So the whole idea of the Dirt Tells is based on the chaparral. It is a religion of affirmation. It is a religion of joy. It is a religion of acceptance. And it's based on four pillars. The first pillar is greet with a beak, which is what I did when I came out. Two bananas together look like the shape of a beak. And so I greeted you in acceptance and respect with the greeting of the beak. Now, when these bananas turn black, we make banana bread out of them, and then we sacrifice, well, we don't sacrifice it, we offer it to the chaparral so that it can eat as an offering to the bird. That is the first pillar. The second pillar is practice humility. You may not know this about the chaparral, but the chaparral actually can fly, but it chooses to walk. 
It does not flaunt its abilities before others. It does not soar above the crowd, but it walks down with the more humble creatures. The adherence to dirt tails will do the same. Pillar three, make hardship your home. The chaparral does not live in the jungle where there's a multitude of water and insects in order to feast upon, but it lives in the desert where water is scarce and insects are, insects are scarce. And so, as adherents to the dirt tells, we take the harder road. We practice. We, we take the harder road. And finally, the fourth pillar is a yearly pilgrimage to the great bird, the great bird that exists outside this very gathering space. So every year in the month of June, all dirt tells in the week you know as encounter will make a pilgrimage to the great bird to offer banana bread. <laughs> These are the four pillars. And here's the thing, all right? Here's the thing about this whole deal. I get to do the rest of my speech in the South now. And these are actually my wife's pajamas. You like them? But the whole, here's the whole thing. This, this, we can really do this. Like I can really in America start this religion of dirt tales. And you could say, you know what? I'm going to agree to that. I'm actually going to, I'm going to believe that this is the way to live life. And if you believe in this whole dirt tell faith, you can live your life by the four pillars. And every June, we would see you coming out here to offer banana bread to this bronze bird out here. And we'd see you wearing fantastic clothing. You could actually live that way. And if you believed in this, then you would live according to this system, right? See, here's the reality. Everybody believes in something. Everybody believes in in something. And there's, there's the mainline faiths you can choose from. Islam. You can choose from Christianity. You can choose from Judaism. You can choose from Hinduism or Buddhism. It's a mainline faith that you can choose from. But there's also these marginal faiths. There's Jediism. Yes, it is a religion that is based off Star Wars. And if you think it's a joke, it's not. Because if you actually Google Jediism, the first thing you come across is this quote. And here's what it says. Although followers of Jediism acknowledge the influence of Star Wars on their religion by following the moral and spiritual code demonstrated by the fictional Jedi, they also insist that their path is different from that of the fictional characters and that Jediism does not focus on the myth and fiction found in Star Wars. The Jedi follow the 16 teachings which are based on the presentation of the fictional Jedi as well as 21 maxims. Somebody wants you to know because it's the first Thing that shows up when you Google Jediism is that there's somebody who's serious about this. They actually live their lives by these 16 maxims and these 21 statements. They live by that standard because everyone believes in something. And whatever you believe in, that determines how you see the world. That determines how you engage the world. That determines the choices you make and the directions you ch ch chase in life. It determines that what you believe, but everybody believes in something. And some of you go, no, no, no. Some people don't believe in God. Exactly. They don't believe in God. That is their belief system. And so they base their world and the way they live and the things they do based off that truth that there is, what they consider to be a truth, that there is no God. You say, well, some people don't believe there's anything as an absolute truth. Well, they believe in one absolute truth, and that is that there is no absolute truth. And it is that standard that sets their belief by which it governs their life and the way they see the world and the way they interact in the world. So the first thing you need to understand tonight is that everyone believes in something, someone, or some truth. Everyone believes in something, someone, or some truth, and that dictates how they interact in the world. And that dictates what they think and how they view the world and the decisions they make. Everybody believes in something someone or some truth. That's the first thing that I think we can agree on. The second thing is this. The second thing is this. On April 14th of this year, when most of your parents and myself were getting ready to pay our taxes, about several hundred Nigerian girls between the ages of 16 and 18 went to school to take their final physics exam. And while they were there, some, extreme, some Muslim extremists came into the school, kidnapped over 200 girls, and then took them out where nobody has found them for a while. And they took them out into other countries. They began to sell them as wives to other Muslim extremists. And if you remember at that moment, almost, the, almost 90% of the world probably at that point stood set up and went, wait a, minute, wait, wait a minute, there's something wrong here. You don't just walk in and kidnap a truckload of girls and take them off and sell them as there's something wrong here. You had the hashtag, bring back our girls, because the world realized there's something broken in this story. 
You say, well, they, the Muslim extremists didn't think there was anything wrong with it. No, but they looked at the Western uni- they looked at the Western world, at the United States, and they said, boy, there's something wrong with America. Their greed and their materialism. So even they realized that there was something wrong with the world. Or I could tell you about a book called Night, about a concentration camp. And there's this horrible scene that's been ingrained on my mind ever since I read it in, in college. And it's this story where the German soldiers take these little Jewish babies, and it says they threw them up in the air, and they used their guns and shot the babies and used them for target practice. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter what faith you have. When you hear that story, you can't even think about it for that long because it, it, it'll mess you up. But when you hear that story, you begin to go, there's something... There's something not right in the world. There's something broken here. Or you can go back to your dorm room tonight and you can stand in the mirror and you can look into your own heart and you realize that there's something not right in you. And there's something not right in me. I think the second thing we can agree on, no matter where we come from, is that the world is broken. That the world is broken. First, everyone believes in something, someone, or some truth. And second, the world is broken. And I think faith religions meet at that point between something to believe in that helps us understand and deal with a broken world. Most religions offer an escape from the broken world. Most religions offer an escape from the broken world. Other religions offer a way to cope with the broken world, to survive it. Humanism and atheism, they focus on the human ability to fix the broken world by using reason or by finding a sinner and finding peace. The, reality, the problem is, though, you can't fix a broken car with broken parts, and we're all broken. But Christianity does not offer simply an escape. It doesn't offer simply an escape. Christianity offers the resurrection. I want you to hear that again. Christianity offers the resurrection. You see, Christianity does not come down to being a religion. It does not come down to a set of spiritual practices. Christianity comes down to a conviction about an event, about an event that altered the universe, that altered the world, that changed the course of history. And that event is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is is the core of Christianity. This whole Christian thing rests on whether Jesus really came back to life or not. Even Jesus and who he claims to be, claiming to be the Son of God, rests on whether he came back to life three days later or not on that Sunday morning. Because if he didn't, he is no Son of God. He is not divine. It rests on that event. You see, thousands of people were crucified. Thousands. There were entire villages that the Romans would crucify. They would come in sometimes and crucify hundreds in one day, lining the streets. There was nothing unique about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The only unique thing about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ was his followers claimed he didn't stay dead. That he didn't stay dead. And that was the number one confession, witness, statement teaching by the early church that was the center of their message about Jesus Christ is that he is no longer dead. Listen to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 45. This is after the resurrection. He's got his followers around him for one last time. He says, then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. And he told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance of forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And then he says, you are witnesses of these things. Witnesses of what things? The fact that I'm no longer dead. Luke, who writes the Gospel of Luke, also writes another book called Acts, Acts chapter 1. So when he uses that same word witness at the beginning of Acts, it should help us know what he's talking about. So Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. He says this to them. It is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. Of what? Of the resurrection. In Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. 
So the Christians' first message, their original message, the center of their faith was that this guy who you crucified, who was dead, is not dead anymore. And so Peter stands up to deliver the first sermon to this huge crowd that had gathered in Jerusalem. And that's exactly what he preaches. Listen to what Peter says. Verse 29 of Acts chapter 2. He says, brothers and sisters, we all know that the patriarch David died and was buried. And his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet. And he knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact that Jesus is no longer dead. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool at your feet. Therefore, he says, because of this, because Jesus is alive, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. The center of the Christian faith is the resurrection. The center of the Christian faith is the resurrection. And if the resurrection is true, then Jesus is not just our Savior. He is our Lord. He is not just the Savior of the world. He is the Lord of the world. So how do we know that Jesus actually came back to life? That's kind of an important question. And unfortunately, Jesus didn't take a selfie of himself as he left the tomb with the grave clothes behind. Boom! Hashtag suckers! I mean, he didn't do that. (laughs) He didn't do that. We don't, I mean, how do we know? I'll tell you why I believe in the resurrection. You may have heard the term Messiah. You may have heard the term Christ. Christ was not Jesus' last name. Jesus Christ. Like, we didn't, people didn't say, Mr. Christ, how are you today? He didn't sign his name, Jesus Christ. Christ is the same word as Messiah. They're just two different languages. Messiah is the Hebrew word. Christ is the Greek word. And the word means anointed one. Jesus was the anointed one. They called him Jesus the anointed one. But here's the thing. He wasn't the only anointed one in Israel's history. David was called the anointed one. The prophets were called the anointed one. And in fact, in Jesus' times, there were many messiahs besides Jesus. There were many messiahs, many anointed ones beside Jesus. So let me set up why. Rome had come in and invaded and taken over Palestine, which is the area that belonged to the Jews. And they gave them some religious freedom as long as they could tax the snot out of them. And so Israel felt oppressed and they felt burdened. So they were waiting for God to anoint someone, a messiah, a Christ, to come and to lead them in war against Rome, to overthrow Rome and to reestablish the kingdom of Israel as the most powerful nation in the world. That's what they were waiting for. And so you had all these different, what we'd call messianic movements. These men who would rise up and claim to be the one who would go and overthrow Rome. You've got actual names from history, like Judas, Simon Bargiora, Bar Kochabar. These are actual historical names of messiahs in and around Jesus' times. And they they accrued a following. People followed them. They believed that they were going to lead Israel to freedom. And so you understand that when Jesus comes on the scene and he starts talking about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God this, the kingdom of God that, and then he starts showing this great power because for Israel, the kingdom of God meant the kingdom of Israel. And then he starts showing this power. No wonder they thought he was the Messiah. I mean, the guy could cast out demons with a word. The guy could control nature with his voice. The guy brought the dead back to life. I mean, you talk about someone you want to follow into battle. How do you lose a war when your general can control nature? I mean, think about it. Right? You're out there and they're like, ha ha, the Romans are like, hey, we got, uh, we got bronze spears, because that's how Romans talk. We got bronze spears. And Peter's like, hey, Jesus, how about some fire from the sky? Shabam! I mean, Jesus walked on water. You can imagine those guys, you know, all sleeping out in the boat, thinking they're safe, the enemy, the Romans out in their ships. And all of a sudden you look out and there's 5,000 men running on the water with torches and swords. That'd give you nightmares. (laughs) So running on the water, 
Or just think if the Romans came and they, they, they got into this big battle with Jesus and his army and they killed every one of Jesus' soldiers except for Jesus. And the, the, side, the, the countryside is just slain with, with these Jewish soldiers' bodies bloodied, bloodied and dead and dying. And the Romans are like, yeah, we win. And Jesus walks out and says, arise. <laughs> and everybody gets up. What do you do to an army that won't stay dead? You surrender is what you do. So no wonder they followed Jesus. People kept claiming to be the Messiah. It was not uncommon in Jesus' day. But here's the difference between the Messianic movement that involved Jesus and all the other Messianic movements. When Judas died, when Simon Bargiora died, when Bar Chabar died, when they died, their movements died. When they were killed by Rome, when they were taken out, their followers were like, I'm out of here. I'm not sticking around for that. Apparently he wasn't the real Messiah because he's dead. And they ran away. And those movements died. No other Jewish messianic movement still exists today. None. So go to Jesus in the garden. Right? He's in the garden. He's, he's praying. And all of a sudden the group shows up to arrest him. To arrest Jesus. You remember that scene? You remember what Peter does? He's like, it's go time, Jesus. Get your, work your mojo, baby. And he pulls out his sword to chop off a head. Because he thinks this is time. We're going to war right now. This is it, Jesus. This is what we've been waiting for. The 12 disciples were following Jesus, in my opinion, because they thought he was going to lead them to victory over Rome. And then when Jesus is arrested, look what happens. History repeats itself. This is from Matthew chapter 26, verse 56. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled, just like every other messianic movement. When Jesus was arrested, he thought, well, I guess he's not the real Messiah either. See you later. And they took off. And the Jesus movement died for three days. For three days. How do you explain that? When every other messianic movement in history, after their leader died, ceased to exist. And Jesus' movement was making the same, taking the same direct course, and then three days later, it takes a sharp left turn and heads the other direction. And then the Jesus movement becomes more popular than it ever had when he was alive. From 120 who re kind of committed their faith to following Jesus to 3,000 after one sermon to eventually by the 4th century becoming the official religion of the entire Roman world. And then here, you and I are here today, and Christianity is as big as it's ever been. And he's dead? And not only that, these, these folks who had abandoned him and turned the other way, all of a sudden, overnight, in an instant, they take a hard left, and now they're sold out for Jesus, more than they were ever sold out when he was alive with them. They end up, a lot of them, giving their lives for his cause. How do you explain that? When every other messianic movement in history died out with its leader, if Jesus was dead, why all the change? Why all the success? Why the growth of the movement? Why dying for a guy who's already dead, who proved himself to be a fake and a fraud? The only explanation is what his followers claim. that He came back to life. That's the only thing that explains that sharp left turn. That's the only thing that explains why we are here today. I don't have a picture of a risen Jesus, but it's hard to argue with that story. It's hard to argue with history. It's hard to argue with what has happened. But why all this? Why such focus on this resurrection? Because if it happened, and I believe with all my heart it happened, then the fate of the whole world rests on that event. The fate of the whole world rests on that event. He is the only hope for the broken world, and here's why. Listen to me. Listen to me. The resurrection is not about life after you're dead. The resurrection is not about the afterlife. There were half of the Jews who already believed that before the resurrection. It's not about life after you're dead. 
The resurrection is not about the resuscitation of Christ. It wasn't like Jesus flatlined and he started moving towards the light at the end of the tunnel. They're like, clear, back, and they brought him back. That's not what it's about. The resurrection, listen, is the reversal of death. The resurrection is the undoing of death. God didn't rescue Jesus from the grip of death. God used the resurrection of Jesus to bludgeon death to death. Do you hear what I'm saying? In the resurrection, Jesus destroyed death. He didn't escape it. He reversed it. He undid it. Death is the ultimate sign that the world is broken. It is the poster child for sin. It says that the world has gone wrong. And so if in the resurrection, Jesus undoes all of that, and that's hope. If the resurrection power undoes the power of death, then what can it do for drug addicts and prostitutes and the greedy and those who struggle with materialism and pornography and selfishness and pride and poverty, and homelessness, and war, and genocide, and abuse, and orphans, and you, and me. What does it mean? If death has been reversed, then Jesus can reverse all of it. That's good news. God is in the process of reversing everything that is wrong in the world. And that is the power of the resurrection. I believe in Jesus because I believe in the resurrection. So all of that to make this point. If you believe in the resurrection, if you believe that Jesus actually came back to life, that means that you believe Jesus is who he claimed to be, that he is the son of God. That you believe he defeated death, which means he is not only your savior, he is Lord. If you believe in the resurrection, then you believe that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Lord means master. When you have a master, you submit everything to him. You're in full obedience to your master. It means we try to see life the way Jesus sees life. We try to understand life the way Jesus understands life. We try to live life the way Jesus lives life and teaches about life. It means what Jesus says about life is truer than what anybody else says about life. It means what Jesus says about life is the smartest thing anyone has ever said about life. Sometimes you act like Jesus is stupid about life. You don't know anything about iPods and iPhones and all that kind of stuff. No, what Jesus says about life is the smartest thing anyone has ever said about life. If you believe that he is, that he is raised from the dead, then you believe that he is Lord, which means you submit everything to him. Which means if the world says, this is black, this is black, this is black, and Jesus says, no, this is white. And we go, but it looks kind of black, Jesus. And Jesus says, it's white. We go, okay, it's white. If the politics and the political world you've grown up in says, this is right, this is right, this is white, this is white, this is white. And Jesus says, no, 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 that's black. You're like, oh, I'm going to go with Jesus, it's black. It means if your church says, this is white, this is white, this is white, this is white. And Jesus says, no, 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 it's actually black. Then you go with what Jesus says. Even if your intuition, even if your gut, even if your feeling leans towards the world or towards any other entity being truth statement out there, it means you go with Jesus if you believe in the resurrection because everything follows under that. Which means Christianity, this, this belief in the resurrection is exclusive by nature. Like you can't believe in the resurrection and say like, hey, but Buddhists and Hinduists... Hinduism and Muslims and Jews and everybody, come on, let's get on the boat, let's have a party. I mean, you can't do that. Because the nature of believing in the resurrection itself excludes other ideas of how the world is going to be redeemed and fixed and restored, how sin is taken care of and how everything that is broken is reversed. It's a pretty particular statement, which means if you believe that, it means you're going to believe that some other things aren't true. It means that you trust what Jesus says about sexuality and not what the world says about sexuality. Not what your friends say about sexuality. Not what TV says about sexuality. It means, it means you believe what Jesus says about money and wealth. Not what the world says. Not what your parents say. Not what anybody else says. It means you believe what Jesus says about career and jobs. Not what anybody else says. Not what the world says. Not what any other message says. You believe what Jesus says about everything in life, you go back to Jesus. 
And here's the thing. If you're convinced that the resurrection is true and that Jesus is who he claims to be, and therefore he is the wisest, truest, smartest person to ever live and knows how to live the best life, then you will be labeled a bigot. You will be labeled intolerant. You will be labeled a hater. But what I've tried to show you tonight is just because you are given those labels doesn't mean it's true. Because everybody believes in something, and I've tried to trace that to where you have the right and the permission to stand up humbly and to express why you believe what you believe. So let me recap that for you. You have the right to say, you know what, I don't agree with you and I think you're wrong and let me tell you why I think you're wrong. Not because I'm smarter than you, not because I'm a better person than you, not because I think I'm greater than you or more righteous than you, but because I believe that Jesus is who he claims to be. And if Jesus is who he claims to be, and the reason I, and if he is who he claims to be, then I believe what he says is the truest thing that could ever be said. That he knows how to live the best life, that he sets up the right kind of standard to live despite what I feel and think sometimes. And the reason I believe Jesus is who he claims to be because I believe that 2,000 years ago, on a Sunday morning, he came back to life. So, I disagree with you. Do not be ashamed. Do not be ashamed of your conviction about Christ. Do not be afraid to speak out about your belief in Jesus. Do not be afraid. Be bold. Be brave. So what does it mean? What does that mean right here, right now? For some of you, it means this next year at school, you've got to quit being ashamed of your faith. I'm not saying Christianity hasn't done some really stupid stuff in our past. We have. We've made a lot of horrible mistakes, and we're going to make a lot more. But you shouldn't be ashamed of your conviction about Jesus and the resurrection of Christ. And so maybe here in a moment when we start praying, you can come up here as we offer an invitation and a song. You come up here, you fill out a card, and maybe you just say, I need courage this year. I've been afraid. I've been a closet Christian. It's time for me to come out and let my faith be known. Some of you need to do that tonight. Some of you, and honestly, this has been my biggest struggle with this whole lesson, is you're like, oh, yeah, let's do this. And you're ready to, like, to take your guns out for Jesus. Like, oh, let's go kill some people for Jesus. Like, metaphorically speaking, right? Like, all militant, like, yeah, we're going to bash the world. We're going to destroy yeah, Hollywood. Watch out, we're coming. We're going to take you down. We're going to boycott everybody. That's, you know, that kind of attitude, that makes me nervous. Um, there's a guy who tells a story about he was about to get on an airplane. He's a Christian. And this young 20-something-year-old gets in front of him. And on the front of his shirt, it says, intolerant. And underneath it says, Jesus says. And he's like, oh, I don't really want to see the back of that shirt. The kid turns around, and it says, Islam is a lie. Homosexuality is a sin. Abortion is murder. That guy wasn't afraid to speak his convictions. The problem is, he wasn't speaking Jesus. There is no such thing, listen to me, if you're one of those militant kind of people like, yeah, Christians against the world, yeah. If you're one of those folks, listen to me. There's no such thing as us versus them. There's no such thing as Christians against the world, Christians against Hollywood, Christians against Muslim. God is for the world. He so loved the world that he sent his son. We are for the world. We are for the world to know Jesus and his love and his resurrection. We are for the world. So if you have one of those, those militant mentalities when it comes to spreading the good news about Jesus, maybe you need to come for prayers tonight. Because I, I want to make this statement. I want you to hear it. The moment you communicate the message of Jesus without love to those whom you're communicating the message, it ceases to be the message of Jesus. Let me say that again. It's kind of a packed statement. The moment you begin to communicate the message of Jesus, the truth of Jesus, without love to whom the people you're speaking the message to, it at that moment ceases to be the truth in the message of Jesus. There is no message of Jesus without it being laden with love at its core. So if you have that mentality, then maybe tonight you need to come and fill out a card and say, you know what, I need compassion and I need love for the broken world. You heard Rob 
and Josh talking about Thursday, there's a chance if you need to be baptized. Maybe tonight you're like, you know what? I really do believe in the resurrection. I never thought about that. I, 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 I'm ready for Jesus to be the Savior and Lord of my life. That's what baptism is. It's the reenactment of that whole thing, the death to your old self and the resur- resurrected new with no more change, with no more pain, with no more sin, the new creation. And you need to come and fill out a card and say, hey, I want to go to those classes. I want to be baptized on Thursday. Or maybe you're here tonight and you believe in the resurrection. You believe in Jesus. But you're held captive by your past. You're held captive by sin. You're like, oh, Charlton, you don't understand. I've done some really heinous stuff. Well, get in line. So have I. And you're like, no, no, Charlton, if I told you what I did, you would, uh, you would say, whoa, actually, you don't belong here. Why don't you get out? The problem is you've let Satan make your sin and your past your identity. But let me ask you a question. Do you believe in the resurrection? Because if Jesus could undo death, your sin is no match for Jesus. You have been raised with Christ your sin, your past, no longer defines you. If you're dealing with shame tonight, you come and you fill out a card and you let us pray over you those words. You are raised with Christ. You are raised with Christ. And finally, maybe you're in here and you believe in the resurrection and you love Jesus as your Lord. I mean, as your Savior, but you don't really want him to be your Lord. You know what I'm talking about? Like, you're like, Jesus, you take care of the afterlife, I'll take care of this one. Right? Dallas Willard said, there's a lot of vampire Christians. We want Jesus just for his blood, just to get us out of hell. Like, hey, Jesus, you know, like, you know what? I'll take care of this life. You worry about the next life. We don't align our life with Jesus. We believe in him. We believe in the resurrection, but we're not aligning our life with Jesus. Here's the thing. If you take Jesus, if you believe in the resurrection, yes, you get Jesus as Savior, but guess what? You also What also comes with the package is Jesus as Lord, which means you align your life to Jesus. Some of you in here tonight are blatantly moving in the opposite direction of Christ, and you know it. I'm not here to condemn you, to make you feel bad. I'm just here to tell you, hey, let Jesus be your Lord. He really knows what's best. Let him free you from the direction you're heading. So maybe you need to come up tonight. You just need to fill out a card and say, hey, this is what I've been doing. I need some prayers. There's no judgment here. There's grace here, but let Jesus be your Lord. I'm going to wrap up with this. It was a Sunday morning. The two women were going to the tomb to anoint Jesus' body with some perfumes and some spices, and as they went into the tomb, it was empty. And an angel came and said, Who are you looking for? Jesus from Nazareth? He's not here. He is risen. Praise be to God.